Hi friends! Welcome to Beautifully Bookish Bethany. In today's video, I'm going to be talking about the books that I read in the first part of November. This mid-month wrap-up is going up a little bit earlier than usual, and part of that is because I've just read so many things in the first half of the month so far, and I feel like I have more than enough to talk about. So we're just going to go ahead and film this now. I am doing NaNoWriMo. My goal is an ambitious one. I'm aiming for 15,000 words. I don't honestly, I don't think I'm going to hit it. If I could keep at the pace that I've been going, I might hit it because I am on track, but I just don't think that's going to happen because I'm traveling for the holidays for American Thanksgiving at the end of the month. So the likelihood of me actually hitting 15,000 pages read is like very small. Who knows? I mean, maybe, maybe, but I, I, I'm not counting on it. That said, we are 13 days into November and I have read 26 things. Granted, a lot of this is manga, but I've read a lot. I do think there's a couple of reasons for this. One piece of it is I think I burned myself out a little bit in October. I took on too much. I did my regular content. I started a new channel and I did this YouTube channel of 30 shorts in 30 days. So I think I was just doing way too much and coming into November have been like, I don't really want to do anything other than read. I feel like that has been a good break for me though, so if you've seen a little less content from me than usual, that is part of why. Don't worry, I do have plans for more content and I can tell that I'm feeling a little bit more refreshed now. This is the first time in a little while that I've sat down to do a more for formal video like this other than just kind of unboxing clips and I'm feeling good. So I, I think we're on our way out of it, but I needed a little bit of a break. That said, let's talk about the books that I've read in the first half of the month. There are a lot of them. I am going to say for the manga, I did a reading vlog where Izzy from Happy For Now picked my TBR and sent me eight volumes of manga to read. I'll link that video up above if you haven't seen it yet. For the manga, because I did that vlog, I'm just going to show you the volumes and tell you my star rating. And if you want to hear my thoughts, I'm going to point you to that video, just because otherwise we're going to be here for much longer than I want to be. And it's already going to be a long video because I have a lot to talk about. So if you are new to my mid-month wrap-ups, the way that these work is I talk about the books in the order that I read them. At the end of the month, I do all of my stats and I talk from lowest rated to highest rated. But for the purposes of this video, I am just going to be talking about the books that I read in chronological order. However, I do have one DNF, so I'm going to begin with that and then we'll jump into all the books that I finished reading. My one DNF is a graphic novel that I picked up an advanced copy of at New York Comic Con. This is Einstein, and it is a graphic biography of Albert Einstein, but I just really wasn't getting on great with it and decided to go ahead and cut my losses. I... it makes some odd choices. It feels like it's framing his life through the women he dated slash had relationships with, which could be done in a good way, but I am not enjoying the way that it's choosing to do that. It's an odd choice and I am just not that interested. So I decided to go ahead and DNF this one. The first book I actually finished reading in November was Tomorrow and Tomorrow and Tomorrow by Gabrielle Zevin. I got this as a book of the month club pick and I also had an audio influencer copy from Libra FM, so thank you to them. If you want to check them out, I will have them linked down below and I did listen to the audiobook for this. I ended up liking this quite a bit. It's interesting because I don't know that it's the kind of book I would normally gravitate towards. The thing that drew my attention about it is that I knew it was about a guy and a girl who are video game developers, and they're kind of best friends that have this entangled relationship that is never actually romantic, but it's very emotionally intense. And it's an interesting book. It's more general veering to literary fiction. I don't know how literary this is, but it's sort of general fiction, but with a lot of video game content. And that was the part of it that I enjoyed the most, to be honest. I really enjoyed the way that this talked about video games. It's clear that the author has a lot of love for the industry and the way that it dealt with the problems of misogyny and racism in the industry, because I think there is a lot of that. It's worth knowing, though, that this book is quite intense in terms of the 
topics that it tackles, things from serious medical issues and disability to death, loss of a loved one, grief. There's a lot of really intense themes in here, which I don't know that I'd heard a lot of other people talk about. So if you need content warnings for any of those things, check them out. I think I included some of them in my Goodreads review. So this wasn't necessarily a home run for me, but I did end up quite liking it and I gave it four stars. The writing itself is also quite lovely. Next, I read The Spare Man by Mary Robinette Kowal. This is one that I had an advanced copy from NetGalley for and this was delightful. I had so much fun with this. I haven't really heard other people talking about it, but if you like science fiction and you like cozy mysteries and you're looking for something with disability representation, you should really check out The Spare Man. I loved it. It is set on kind of a cruise ship, but in space, following a celebrity and her new husband as they are anonymously on their honeymoon cruising to Mars when somebody dies and it seems like her new husband is perhaps being framed for the murder. So it's an isolated closed circle murder mystery set on a spaceship to Mars amongst elite people and it's a lot of fun. I also really enjoyed the romantic piece of it. I liked the relationship between our two lead characters and the other interesting thing is that our heroine is disabled due to a really serious accident. She had spinal injuries and is living with chronic pain and has this device that helps her manage pain to make it possible for her to sort of live through her day. She uses a cane. She also has PTSD and panic attacks and so all of this is depicted in the book, but she's also putting herself in potentially dangerous situations, trying to figure out who really murdered people on the ship and save her new husband. She also has a really adorable dog, if that's something that appeals to you. I liked this one a lot. I gave it four and a half stars, and I really hope that this turns into a series. I would absolutely love to see a running series of spacey tech murder mysteries with this woman as a heroine. She's smart, she's interesting, she's strong, she's a brilliant engineer. Just everything about this really worked for me. And again, it's not something I've heard a lot of other people talking about, but I think it is a whole lot of fun. So if that sounds up your alley, that kind of mashup, it, it's definitely worth a look. Then I read Neom by La Vie Tidar. This was sent to me by the publisher for review. And one thing that I, and I, I, I'm gonna be honest, I feel a little dumb about this, but I think it's just not in the zeitgeist here in the way that it is in other parts of the world. But I wasn't aware until after I read it when someone commented on my review that this is based in the future of a city that is currently being built in the Middle East that is integrating technology and like artificial intelligence and stuff, which is fascinating and I guess ballsy. <laughs> on the part of the author to write about this dystopian future of a city that doesn't even exist yet. I had no idea that this was based on an actual city that is being built, but apparently it's everywhere there. And so thank you to the person who educated me on this on Goodreads. I think that gives me a lot more context for this book. <laughs> This is a book that I thought had some cool ideas in terms of world building and technology, but it didn't come together for me as a novel in the way that I wanted it to. We followed a bunch of different perspectives. I felt like the character work was very shallow. I never cared that much about most of the characters. I don't think we spent enough time getting to know them. And the story felt a bit disjointed. It was very slow paced, definitely not driven by the plot. There are some plot points that come together at the end, and I think it's supposed to be a climax, but again, I just wasn't invested enough in the story for it to hit the way I think it was supposed to. So yeah, for me, this book just didn't work as a novel. I think it's exploring some interesting ideas. It is set, as I said, in this kind of dystopian future where some people have emigrated off planet, some people are left in this city in the Middle East, and you know, it's dealing with questions of artificial intelligence and what makes you a person. I don't know that it's doing a lot that's super new in the way that it's exploring those things. Yeah, I ended up giving this one two stars. It was okay. I didn't think it was terrible, but it just didn't really work for me as a novel. The added information, though, that this is writing about the future of a place that is currently being built, <laughs> I don't know. I'm not sure what to say about that. It's a, an interesting fact. Then I finished reading what is 
a freaking masterpiece. I read a lot of this in October and finished it in November because I was doing a reading vlog for my patrons. So if you want to see me alternatively gush over the brilliance of this book and cry on camera, <laughs> consider joining me on Patreon because uh, you can check it out. This is The Paper Menagerie and Other Stories by Ken Liu. This made me cry several times, several times, which, listen, I am not a big crier. There's usually a few books every year that will do it, but I kid you not, four or five of these stories had me crying. Um, yeah, and also the richness of the themes, the the amazing the the mind of Ken Liu to understand enough to write what he wrote not just thematically but in terms of the science content the way that he uses fantasy and science fiction and alternate history to tell these big deep human stories I just like oh my god Oh my god, masterful. This this book is masterful. I would call this literary speculative short stories. They have a very literary vibe to them. I, l listen, objectively, this might be the best thing that I've read all year. I was blown away. Clearly, I need to read more from Ken Liu. I do have the first book in his adult fantasy series on my TBR, and it makes me anxious to get to it. I like, man, I thank you so much to my patrons for making me read this because while I had a copy and I did want to read it, I don't know when I would have gotten around to it if you hadn't voted for me to vlog it for you. So thank you. I appreciate it. It was amazing. And if you haven't guessed, I did in fact give this book six stars, which is what I give to a favorite of the year. Easily, easily favorite of the year status no question. Then I read one of my most anticipated books of the year and it did not disappoint. This was very enjoyable. It is The Luminaries by Susan Dennard. You might know Susan from the Witchland series, which I am a huge fan of, but I understand that that series is a little intense for some people. It is slower paced. It's got a lot more plot threads and things happening. It can be a little dense at time. It may not be everybody's type of fantasy. So if that is how you felt, I would suggest to you that you pick up the luminaries because man, this was such a good time. It is such a page turner. It's only got a single point of view and it is more contemporary fantasy with this really interesting world, interesting creatures, some romance. I thoroughly enjoyed this. This feels like a throwback to like 2010s fun, fast paced YA in some ways, but better. I will say not my favorite book from her. I didn't necessarily love where it left us. It leaves us on a bit of a cliffhanger and it's quite a short novel. I feel like this could have stood to be a little bit longer. I don't know that the place it ended was as emotionally satisfying as I wanted it to be, but I still had a really great time with it and didn't want to put it down. I feel like you could fly through this very quickly and I gave it four stars. So I would definitely recommend it if you're looking for an easy entry point into her work. I think this gives you a taste of what she does in a faster paced, more accessible version. Next up, I read The Last Last Day of Summer by Lamar Giles. This is a middle grade book that I had been reading aloud to my kids before bed. If you've noticed, I've been reading a lot more middle grade lately. That's part of why we've been starting to actually work our way through some novels and it's been fun. This was a blast. And I would highly recommend this to parents of kids in this age group. If you're looking for a fun, entertaining, fast paced, action packed book that is also centering two black kids where the story is not about trauma, this is such a good one to pick up. It was so enjoyable. My kids thought it was hilarious and I had a good time reading it as well. It follows these two cousins who live in a very strange town and they're known for helping out with supernatural things. They are really bummed because it is the very last day of summer before they have to go back to school and they wish, wish, wish that the summer could be a little longer and then they get their wish, but not in the way they might have hoped they accidentally end up freezing everything in their town and freezing time in their town and a bunch of sort of monsters and creatures end up 
invading and they have to figure out a way to fix things and bring things back to normal so that time can progress. It's fun, it's funny, it's got a lot of heart, it's got this great relationship between these cousins. I thoroughly enjoyed this and definitely would recommend, and I think it's the start of a series so I may pick up book two. One thing that is worth noting is that while most of this is just a really good time, there is a plot point that is not resolved in this book where one of the cousins finds out from his future self, spoilers, sorry, but you know for parents out there, um, finds out from his future self that his cousin dies early from some kind of a blood disorder and he wants to try to find a way to save him and hasn't told his cousin at the end of the book. So that part is a little bit heavy. Most of the book is funny and light and that isn't resolved here but I think it probably is in future books four and a half stars. Next I listened to Making Love with the Land by Joshua Whitehead. This is a collection of essays that made me feel kind of dumb. <laughs> Um, I feel like Joshua, it made me feel like Joshua Whitehead is probably smarter than I am. Yeah, I mean, maybe less that, maybe more. He is better versed in literary theory than I am. That is maybe the more accurate way of putting it. But I had this as an audio review copy from Libra FM. Joshua Whitehead is a two-spirit indigenous author. And this collection was really intense. It deals with a lot of really personal, vulnerable things. Things like trauma and abuse and sexual assault and disordered eating, but also things to do with literary theory and how that merges with indigenous identity. It was a range of things. I think there are things that are very raw and very moving. And then there are things that are like very brainy in a way that I didn't totally get. Parts of this are more accessible than others. I think that is the biggest thing with this. So I wasn't shocked when I went and saw that it was put out by a university press. Honestly, that makes a lot more sense to me that a university press put out this book because it does feel quite academic at times. But I still really liked it. I gave it four stars. And if that sounds up your alley, I think it's worth a look. Just kind of a heads up that parts of it are more easily accessible than others. And I read this for the Skoden Readathon, which is being hosted this month by Native Lady Book Warrior. Next up, I finally finished reading Babel by R.F. Kuang. Uh, and I have complicated feelings about this book. This is why I've been putting it off, honestly. People were like, why are you putting it off? And I was like, because I am so highly anticipating it. I am scared. It is not going to live up to the hype I have for it in my head. And that both is and isn't true. How much do I want to get into this here? I talk about this at greater length in my Goodreads review, which was a difficult review for me to write, to be honest, because in some ways this book is brilliant. It's clear that R.F. Kuang knows a lot about translation, about history, about empire and colonization. Those pieces of it to me were really fascinating. You know, I would say that probably 30% of this book is just etymology. And that alone, honestly, is not going to be everybody's cup of tea. I completely understand why there are people who are like, this is so tedious. Why are we doing so much etymology? That part I actually really enjoyed. That was probably my highlight of the book. I like the focus on etymology, the history of words, these ideas of translation. I think the magic system is very cool. This idea of power coming from the gap between words in different languages and what is missing in translation and sort of the directionality in the choice of translation. Brilliant. Absolutely loved it. Thematically too, I think this book is doing a lot right. It is a bit aggressive in pushing the themes. So people who feel like this is too on the nose, it's too repetitive in pushing what it's trying to do. I get where they're coming from. I was less bothered by that, I think, than some readers, but I understand it. But I like the themes. I like the idea of showing a different side of the experience in a place of higher learning like Oxford for people who are not privileged white men, for people who are international students, for women, women of color. And I think that this book does a really excellent job of showing that disparity and showing some of the, the problems that exist in dark academia. This has been called dark academia, and I don't think that is entirely accurate. I would call this a response to dark academia, but I think if you go in looking for the, the vibes and the experience of reading dark academia, which I enjoy, I enjoy reading those books, I don't think that's what you're gonna get here. 
that's fine for me, just something worth knowing. The place where for me this really fell short was in the characters. The characters are all very young and I've read books like this before where you have young characters in college who are impulsive and rash and doing dumb things, but the author is writing from a place of distance from that experience and reflecting back on it. And that is not what this book feels like to me. And I think because the project of the book is to talk about these big things like empire and power and colonization as funneled through the experiences of a handful of university students, it, it just didn't connect for me the way that I wanted it to. And, and it's the kind of thing that I just wonder, had Rebecca written the same book in 10 years, I think the themes and the ideas would be the same, but I feel like the nuances of the character work would be different and maybe would have worked better for me. That said, I think in a lot of ways this book is really an accomplishment. I get what she was doing with it and I did like it. So I ultimately ended up giving this four stars. Not a bad rating by any means. I certainly felt more positively towards this than anything else. But this was a book that I was hoping would be a new all-time favorite and unfortunately for me that just didn't end up being the case. And I do think that this is going to be a polarizing one. I understand why there are people who adore it. I also understand why there are people where it is really not for them. That said though, I am thrilled for Rebecca that it has done so well and has been such a bestseller. I, I had to change the battery, but I think I was just saying that regardless of the fact that this wasn't a new absolute favorite for me, I am thrilled that it's been doing as well as it has. I love that this kind of thing is hitting in the way that it is. I am excited to see more from RF Kuang in the future. I think she's really smart and I think a lot of her academic background comes through in this book and her own experience with translation. Again, the characterization is the place where this just didn't work for me in the way that I hoped it would, but still four stars. Then I read a whole bunch of manga. Again, I am just going to tell you what I read and what I rated things. If you want to hear detailed thoughts, go and check out my reading vlog and go check out Izzy's too if you want to see what I sent her to read because I sent her some graphic novels and that was really fun to do. Skip and Loafer Volume 1 by Misaki Takamatsu. Also apologies if I don't get the names all entirely correct. I, I may not and maybe I should have looked them up but here we are. Uh, <laughs> I have limited time to film today, but uh, Skip and Loafer Volume 1 by Misaki Takamatsu. I gave this one five stars and it was freaking adorable. I read Sacrificial Princess and the King of Beasts Volume 1 by Yu Tomofuji and I gave this two and a half stars. I read Blue Flag Volume 1 by Kaito and I gave it four stars. I read I'll Never Be Your Crown Princess Volume 1 by Saki Tsukigami art by Natsu Kuroki, and I gave this two stars. I read Sweat and Soap Volume 1 by Kintetsu Yamada, and I gave it three stars. I read Sweat and Soap Volume 2 and gave it four stars. I read Witch Hat Atelier Volume 1 by Kamome Shirahama, and I gave it five stars. And lastly, I read Wotakoi Love is Hard for Otaku Volume 1 by Fujita, and I gave it four stars. So if you want to get my reactions as a manga newbie to all of those volumes of manga, go check out that video. Next up, I read Night of the Living Res by Morgan Talty. This is another one that I had as an audio influencer copy for review from Libra FM, and I read it for the Skoden Readathon. So here's the thing. This is the case of something just really not being my thing and not being what I thought it was gonna be. It's a short story collection that's kind of been marketed as horror and while there are a couple of stories that you could argue lean towards horror, overall this is more of a sort of literary slash general fiction collection that is a lot about messy family dynamics, addiction, trauma, and I feel like reading and reviewing a collection like this is difficult because a lot depends on what I'm rating it on. I don't think it was a poorly written collection, but I think it was just really not for me. And I think another problem I ran afoul of, and 
It is entirely possible that this is because I listened to it as an audiobook, but all the stories felt like they kind of bled together. I can't tell how much of that is the audio narration and how much of it is the writing, but I often had a really difficult time differentiating between characters from different stories. They frequently kind of felt like the same characters, but they weren't. And I, I think for me, the types of stories this was telling, I needed longer with specific characters. I think the mix of the types of stories and the format of being these short stories that didn't necessarily feel the most distinct from each other didn't really work for me. I ended up giving this book two stars. It was okay and I think for people who enjoy this type of story and this type of fiction it's not done poorly but I I had a hard time with it and didn't necessarily have a great time reading it. One of those things where I think it just wasn't for me. Then I read Into the Wind Racked Wilds by A. Deborah Baker aka Shauna McGuire. This is the third installment of this spin-off series that she's been writing of children's books that are mentioned in Middle Game. It's very meta. The first two installments I really enjoyed. They read kind of like the Wayward Children series, only younger, like more for a middle grade audience almost. And I think this volume I just found less interesting than previous volumes. I feel like we're getting a lot of the same thing happening. I'm not sure where the stories are going. I'm starting to kind of lose interest. I think the last third of the book picks up pace and has more interesting actual plot developments, but a lot of this book I was like, okay, <laughs> yeah, we're kind of doing the same thing over again. So three stars for me, definitely my least favorite of the series. I still had an okay time with it. It was whimsical, it was cozy, which I think is what I go to some of these books by Sean and McGuire for, but I, I'm, I'm questioning where we're going <laughs> with the series. Next I read The Moth Keeper by Kay O'Neill, and this is actually my very first 2023 release. I had an advanced digital copy of this graphic novel for review. It is so good. It's so good. It's coming out in March. So I read it a little bit early because I wanted to. I knew I was going to have a good time with it and that was just what I needed in that moment. I know from previous experience that I love Kay O'Neill's work and uh, this graphic novel was so good and beautiful. It is about a young girl who is the new moth keeper for her village and it's a job that's very important but it's one that requires a lot of solitude in the middle of the night. And this is a book about burnout and about the importance of community and support in the work that you're doing in a way that is accessible for young readers, which I love, especially with what COVID did for so many of us, for adults, but also for children. I just, I loved this. I love the artwork. I love the relationships. I thought this was really, really beautiful. And if you have any interest in it, I would highly recommend checking it out again. It comes out in March. So we've got some time. But I was a big fan. And I gave this book six stars, which is a favorite of the year. I like I've waffled on this a little bit because, you know, this kind of a children's graphic novel story is not normally something that would be on my favorites list. But I have zero complaints and I found it to be very moving. I teared up while I was reading it and it's just so lovely and wholesome and healing. Anyway, I loved it. Go check it out. It's great. After that, I read My Mechanical Romance by Alexine Farrell Falmouth. This is the other name that Olivia Blake, author of The Atlas Six, writes under, and this is nerdy YA romance. I loved this book. It was so good. It was doing exactly what I wanted it to do, especially in terms of highlighting the experiences of women in STEM. Like it draws you in with the idea that it's going to be this nerdy romance between two rivals on a robotics team, and it is, but really, really what this book is, is a very well executed unpacking of what it means to be a woman in STEM and some of the problems and assumptions that go along with that. It talks about women not being taken seriously. It also talks about pretty or more overtly feminine women not being taken seriously because of that, because I guess if you wear makeup, you can't also be a good engineer 
or something. And the ways that the gendering of the sciences ends up being systemic and really harms the potential careers of young women. Teachers are less likely to push them into that direction, and the way that the university system in the U.S. is set up makes it really difficult for them to decide later on and still be at the top of their game. I love the way this handles things. I was nervous partway through because there was some kind of girl hate between our main character and the one other girl on the robotics team who's kind of like plain and introverted and prickly and whatever, but that actually ended up being worked out really nicely by the end of the book, and I think had some strong things to say about the importance of women being there for each other in STEM. And in this case, we also get two characters who are biracial and are bringing other identities into the picture as well. So this was really great. I gave it four and a half stars and rounded up to five on Goodreads. I was sent a copy of this for review from the publisher, so thank you to them. But if those are themes that appeal to you, I think this is well worth the read. It's very fast paced, very quick to get through, but um, a good one. How much can I get through before my camera decides to overheat? Man, I read so, like so much. Okay, I'm gonna try to, jeez, ah, I'm gonna try to speed it up a little bit. I read Demon in the Wood by Lee Bardugo and Danny Pendergast. This is a graphic novel expanded version of a short story that was previously written that is the backstory of The Darkling and it gives some context into why he is the way he is, his motivations. I really enjoyed it. I think if you're a fan of the Grisha verse, if you are a fan of Shadow and Bone, this is worth picking up, and I enjoyed the artwork as well. I gave this graphic novel four stars. Then I read The Lights on Knockbridge Lane by Rowan Parrish, and I am going to hopefully talk about this at the end of the month. Harlequin is an imprint of HarperCollins, and HarperCollins is currently the only major publisher with a union, and the HarperCollins union is on strike for better diversity, better wages. They've been without a contract for six months and are asking reviewers to hold their reviews until they do get a fair contract. So in support of the HarperCollins union strike, I will not be reviewing the lights on Knockbridge Lane until they have a fair bargain. So you, hopefully you'll get to hear my thoughts in my end of month wrap up. Then I read The Hellmouth Guardian's Lover by Adriana Herrera. This is a erotic monster romance novella from an author who I really enjoy. And this was no different. I mean, I never have a bad time reading her books. I think they generally just work for me pretty well. <laughs> this one was fun. If you like monster romance, it is about a serpent demon and his former assigned Hellmouth Guardian and their second chance romance after he broke her heart. It's very steamy and fun, and I liked it. I gave it four stars. All right, we have three more books to talk about. Oh my god, like, how did I read so much? I read Angel's Tread by Rebecca Roanhorse. This I have pre-ordered, and I had an early copy from NetGalley, which is what I read. It is a, I don't know if it's a novella or just a short novel. It's right around 200 pages. It's a bit of a change of pace for Rebecca Roanhorse, but I really enjoyed it. I thought this was fun. It's a, what, what would you call this? It's like a fantasy western paranormal murder mystery with angel and demon mythology, which is such an interesting combination of things that I never would have thought to put together, but I think it worked. I might have liked this to be a little bit longer, but I quite enjoyed it. It's clearly intending to use the angel demon pieces of society as commentary on race relations. So in this world, the elect are the descendants of angels who sort of rule society. The fallen are the descendants of demons or like half human on, on both sides, and they are at the lower part of society. And our main character is biracial. She is half fallen, but could pass as elect, but she doesn't because her sister is visibly fallen. So she works in a gambling hall. There's a demon who broke her heart a while back and she wants nothing to do with him again, except that her sister has now been arrested for the supposed murder of a virtue, which is like a super high up special elect. And she is willing to do anything to save her sister, including reconnect with the demon who broke her heart. So that's what this is. I thought it was fun. I liked the mystery elements of it. Again, I might have liked this to be a little bit longer. It could have been a bit more fleshed out, but overall it was quite enjoyable and I gave it four stars. Two more books to talk about and both of these are books that I have 
complicated feelings about. So let's get into it. First, I read Trick by Natalia Jaster. This is our book club pick for Patreon book club. And this was a weird experience. And I'll tell you why. When we initially voted on this, I had heard really good things about this upper YA slash new adult fantasy romance. Okay. And then we found out that the author had decided to pull this version and rewrite it as an adult erotic romance, which she did. So I already had a copy of the original version. I also decided to acquire a digital copy of the new version, which is what I started out reading and was struggling a bit. So I decided to try this and ultimately ended up reading the original version and intermittently skimming the new version. And I have very different feelings about the two different versions of this book. So here's the thing. This book was already a little bit on the steamy side. It does hold back some. There aren't as many scenes. They're not as lengthy or quite as explicitly described in the same ways. But I liked it a lot better. The new version felt like it was trying so hard to integrate sex into everything. It wasn't just, I just assumed it would be like adding in a few scenes and changing their ages. No, no. It was a lot more than that. It made it feel very overwritten. It was, in my opinion, cringy at times. And I also just think that it didn't work for the characters. It kind of, at least for me, and it was weird reading them side by side, to be honest, because I was having such different experiences with each book. But for me, it was also ruining the hero. I, I don't have a problem with erotic romance. I can like erotic romance. I do read it. But not every book has to be erotic romance, right? Like, I don't think that works for every story and for every character. And I really just don't think it worked for this in the way that it was done. I think the author was trying to hop on the TikTok sexy romance hype train and do a rewrite. So I understand, I guess, why from a marketing position, but I feel like it's really unfortunate that you can now no longer get your hands on the original version of this because I like this version a lot better. The other thing that I hadn't heard anybody talk about and I feel like is important to say about it is that this is a book that is dealing with some heavy issues. The main theme of the book is the systemic abuse of disabled, mentally ill, and neurodiverse people. And I, like, again, I had not heard anybody say that <laughs> before I picked it up. And that's a really big content warning for this book. I see what the author was trying to do with it and appreciate it. But I also, I, I would be very curious to hear people from those communities take on the way it was handled, because I do think there could be an argument that it's a little bit ableist in how the story is resolved. All that to say, we take this guy who was this mysterious, alluring, smart hero and turn him into this much more aggressive guy who prowls. <laughs> it's like he uses like an alpha male language. I don't know. I just, I didn't, yeah, I, I, I did not like the new version is what I'm telling you. So on Goodreads, I ended up giving it a three because this version would have been a four. Also, they changed the ending. I like the ending. The ending in this book was satisfying. The ending in the new one is not as satisfying. And I get why. I think it's because she wanted to be able to write more books. I, I'm still less of a fan. So this version, four stars. New version, two stars, maybe. Um... So yeah, like, unfortunately, unless you can get your hands on a used copy of this, it's out of print. So I don't know what to tell you. <laughs> that was a weird one. The final book that I read in the first part of November is The House of Always by Jen Lyons. This is the fourth book in the series. And I feel like I have kind of an unpopular opinion on this book. There are a lot of people who really love it. 
I, I have very mixed feelings about this. I get what this book was trying to do. I think the entire series in different ways is being quite experimental, especially with form and structure. And this does something different than other books have done in terms of form. Almost the entire book, which is over 500 pages, is told as a series of non-linear flashbacks from a whole bunch of characters, while all of those characters are technically in a single location, which is an interesting concept. It has a satisfying payoff at the end, but it takes almost 500 pages to get there. And it's too much. It's way too long. I, I felt like it was tedious to get through a lot of this book. It had some great moments. It had some like the like the the bones of the plot arc of this book were cool and clever and interesting. Some of the character development things that happened in the course of this book were also really good. Some of the world building choices were really interesting. However, I don't know that I would say it was entirely worth how much we had to get through to get to that point. Again, I feel like this is kind of an unpopular opinion on this one. Other people seem to really love The House of Always, but I, I thought it was too long. There was too much in it that felt extraneous. It felt like the author found it interesting, but it wasn't necessarily moving the plot forward. And I just struggled with it. This is the sort of book that I could see maybe if I did a reread of the series in close succession, I might do a little bit better with it. But my experience was not ideal the first time around. I ended up giving this three stars because there are things that I like, but this might be my least favorite installment in the series so far. And there's one book left to go in that series. So, ha, huh, man. There you go. <laughs> Those are the 26 things that I read in the first 13 days of the month, which is wild. I mean, keep in mind, I read seven volumes of manga in one day. So that was a big chunk of this. But still, yeah, there, there's no way there's no way I'm going to keep this up for the rest of the month. But it has actually been kind of a nice break from creating content. I think I needed that after October. And so I guess you see how much I can read when I'm mostly reading and not making a lot of videos. <laughs> <laughs> talk to me in the comments down below. Let me know any of your thoughts or feelings on anything I talked about in this video. And for question of the day, tell me about a book that you were highly anticipating that didn't quite live up to your expectations. Maybe it wasn't terrible and you still liked it, but it wasn't what you hoped it would be. That's definitely how I'm feeling about Babel. I liked it, but it, it wasn't everything that I had built it up to be in my head. And some of that's on me, but let me know if you have something like that in the comments down below. If you like this video, it always helps if you give it a thumbs up. Subscribe if you want to see more. Thank you so much for watching, and I will see you next time.